Hello and welcome to Celtic Down Under. My name is Laura and I'm joined by Liam for yet another World Cup preview video. We've covered the first team in Group D, France, uh, but we are following that up this time with Denmark, as you can see by Liam's amazing shirt there. How are you doing, Liam? Good, good. Uh, looking forward to this one. Denmark is uh, what you would call my probably my second team at this World Cup after Japan, so uh, I'm uh, very excited to, to look at this today. Well, for pretty obvious reasons, as we will get into as the as the as the preview goes on, they have become a lot of people's second team um, after events at Euro twenty twenty, which we will, uh, we will no doubt discuss. But um, we'll we'll start with um, just a little bit about that shirt that you're wearing. So, what exact hmm. what vintage is that one? This is from the uh, the nineteen eighty six World Cup, where okay. um, the first real major international tournament where Denmark burst onto the scene. Um, you had uh, the the attacking front pair of Michael Laudrup and uh, Elkia, who uh, really took the tournament by storm in the first round. Uh, you know, beat Uruguay 6-1, beat Germany, who went on to the final that year, um, and uh, beat Scotland as well. Uh, wow. But, of course... Uh, like a lot of great World Cup teams, they then had one bad game against Spain and they were out. So, um, but it's, uh, the, my... it's the brutal nature of World Cup football. I have to say, you can, you can, there's so many times I could mention over the years where there's been a team that you just think, oh, they're they're quite good. They're maybe going to surprise a few folk, and then before you know it, they're out and forgotten about. Yeah, yeah, but um, my my thing with Denmark kind of goes back to uh, the 1992 European Championship. Because mm -hmm. that was, I was, uh, let's see, I was eight years old at the time, just getting into football. Um, I was slightly too young when Italia 90 was on. So Euro 92 was the first big football tournament I remember watching, like mm -hmm. watching every game and really getting into it. And uh, that Denmark team that, you know, only got there because of a uh, war breaking out in the former Yugoslavia. Yeah. Um, we're basically, you know, the players were on the beach, um, as uh, as Peter Schmeichel tells it, says they were on the beach, and then uh, t three weeks later we were lifting up the trophy. You know, that's kind of how it how it went. Um, I, I doubt there's a I doubt there's a more um, fantastic story than that in terms of international football. And of course they did it without their talisman Michael Laudrup, who'd fallen it with fallen out with the manager around that time and would later return, but. Um, but obviously, um, not managed to to win anything. There's there's an argument there to be said that he kind of hamstrung the team from doing what they could because everything did flow through him as magnificent a player as he was. But yeah, that's that's a time before my time. I have to say. Going the other way though, that that team were such a good team, and I think it's because they had to be because they were missing their best player effectively. You know. Yeah. And yeah. Sometimes that can galvanise a team. So. Absolutely, I'm sure there's there's instances of that, not least uh, that. Oh, that's my my watch. My my Apple Watch is agreeing with us there. Um, but um, <laughs> there's other teams, I'm sure, like like Senegal, who who may face such adversity with with losing money for the World Cup. We'll see how that goes. But mm. back to Denmark and back to the current situation in which uh, we find ourselves with them now. Having spoken to you a lot about the World Cup. So far, as we've been making this um, this program, you you really do have a soft spot for Denmark and really think mm -hmm. they could do quite well. Um, as we said, it's, they've become a lot of people's second second team, not least because of what happened with Christian Eriksen at the at the Euro twenty twenty. Um, a harrowing, harrowing set of events. That the more details that come out about it, it doesn't paint anybody at UEFA in a good light doesn't paint anybody at the, the TV companies in a particularly good light. A lot of the players who were involved in that Euro 2020 squad will be going to this World Cup. How, how affected do you think they'll be by by the events of, of 2021? Well, I, I think that they will carry forward uh, the same determination and the same kind of uh, how I say, sense of community within that team that really that event kind of brought them all together and you could see it in the way they played those guys were playing for each other that was it was a, it was like a club team 
um, and hopefully that that spirit. There's a couple of new players that have come on the scene since then, but hopefully that spirit continues. I really hope it does, and like 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 we've said already, it it was it it was a a time where they they really became people's second team. They wanted to see them do well because of because of exactly how they managed to overcome such adversity, and obviously the fact that Christian Eriksen, uh, just over a year on, eighteen months on from that event, is going to be playing again at a major tournament for his country is is as much of a miracle as it is the fact that he's even still alive. So um. Hope he does well, but let's look at how um, Denmark got to this this World Cup. Let's see how they made it. Let's um, share the screen there. Oh, that's a lovely <laughs> thing to see first and foremost, but that's not what we are looking for. Um, we are looking for the group standings. Um, Scotland obviously ended in glorious failure with that 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 victory over Denmark, but Denmark topped the group. Didn't didn't exactly. Um, Struggle, you have to say. One loss and nine wins, 27 points against a a group, I have to say, not to blow Scotland's own trumpet, but but a Scotland team who are about as strong as they've been in a a number of years. And, you know, teams like Israel and Austria, who are never pushovers, Faroe Islands and Moldova are very often also runs. But, you know, there there were potential banana skins there for Denmark that they didn't uh, slip up with. And... um, does that does that signal anything to you going into this tournament as to how strong their their performance might be? Yeah, the thing is, like Denmark are one of those teams that, um, you know, it, it's very rare that they have a shock defeat. Um, you know, for example, like um, Hungary beating England recently, North Macedonia beating Italy in the in the qualifiers for this tournament. Um, you know, those shocks happen now and again to those teams but Denmark are just a good solid consistent team arguably the only shock result they've had in recent years was Scotland beating them so mm-hmm. um, and even then by that point to, to from the Danish perspective it didn't really matter because they were already well on their way to qualification so yeah I mean it's uh it's unfortunate for Scotland that that was the case but we have to take the t- take the wins where we can um, looking at the the fixtures that they've got coming up, we've already covered arguably the strongest um team in their in their group um in France, but they've got um they've got a decent chance themselves of having an impact in the group stage. Now that we look at the fixtures that they've got, they've obviously got mm. an opener against Tunisia that most people would take. I think most teams would suggest that that's a pretty um. A pretty easy opener for them. They've got to go over that hump of France in the middle of the, the, the fixtures. And then Australia, which... I mean, I don't know an awful lot about the Australia team, I have to say. I don't know how likely or how tough a, an opponent they're likely to be. But I've got to say, as much as I don't know that Denmark are favourites for the tournament or anything like it, to me, of all the groups I've looked at so far, they're one of the teams where I think, yeah, no at least second place is going to be easy enough for them to capture. Am I giving them too much credit there? No, no. I think that this group um, should... Now, I did say on my France episode that I thought there was a chance France could could be that that um, big team that, that crashes and burns at the first hurdle. But let's assume that they don't. If the form mm-hmm. guide goes the way it should... Yeah, it's it's France and Denmark in this group, but quite clearly, um, no offence to our Australian friends, um, but Australia and Tunisia are not on the same level as Denmark and France if all the teams play to their full potential. And I think looking at the sequence of games as we like to do, the 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 only way in which I could see Denmark slipping up is. You know, you go into the France game with confidence off of what is pre- presumably going to be a decent win against Tunisia, but if they get the stuff and knocked out of them by France, if France are really flying and on form and for some reason they really um, give Denmark a doing, to use a Scottish phrase, mm. Australia are tricky enough that a, that a down on their luck and an, a, an unconfident Denmark team could, could find that last that last fixture tricky. Is that fair to say? Yeah, because you you would also assume that Australia would have enough to take care of Tunisia as well and, and, and at the same time yeah. as France are dishing out this theoretical 
gubbin to Denmark. Um, so, uh, theoretical gubbin, that's a phrase I never thought I would use, but there you go. Um, the, uh, the, um, that would then mean that Australia go into that Denmark game still having a chance of getting out of the group. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they have that added incentive. Like you say, Denmark would then have that kind of uneasiness of like, we have to win this game to be sure of going through. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the the fact that um, I mean I always like it in groups where when you think about the two teams that are going to challenge for second place, I think it's good when they play each other last. Yeah, because yeah. that's where you can have some really interesting narratives. And as I said before, France Denmark for me that is the tie of round one, apart from possibly Spain versus Germany. Um, I yeah. think that's going to be an amazing game of football. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch both of those ties and certainly um, that's been one of the good things, to be honest, about about doing these these preview shows with you is, is you know, we've found narratives that we didn't even think existed. Um, I, was, I was actually listening back to some of the shows because at the time of recording, uh, the first shows have gone live on the channel and feel free to to um to to watch them back but like even the narrative in group a of the fact that qatar are the asian champions and senegal are the african champions that these wee narratives that you don't think about are are, are available in all these groups that mean there isn't going to be such a thing as a dead rubber at this world cup i don't think no no there's always there's always pride to play for if nothing else and yeah that's like that's a cliche but at the world cup it genuinely does mean something yeah, absolutely. Looking at the looking at the World Cup squad um, that we that we have, um, I'll just pull that up just now. Um, we'll start with the goalkeepers. Obviously, I think it's it's pretty clear who the the initial um, the initial um, first choice is going to be, which is Casper Schmeichel, um, now playing for Nice, but obviously off the back of an incredible um, successful period at um, Leicester. Um, how important is he to, to Denmark's chances of progressing at this tournament? Probably as important as his dad was in 1992, I would suggest. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, Denmark have always built from a solid back line and that has been, you know, having a good goalkeeper is is crucial to that and Schmeichel is one of the best. Um, maybe not quite the keeper that his father was, but I think a very, very capable and very commanding presence and uh, also uh, a natural leader, the, the kind of Absolutely. guy that you want who's going to marshal the defence as well. Not the only natural leader that we have in this um, this squad. When you look at the um, the defenders there, Simon Kier, um, who's usually the captain of the squad, sticks out, plays for AC Milan. Um, you've got Andreas Christensen, formerly of Chelsea, but now of Barcelona. Um, and 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 George Jim Anderson of, of Crystal Palace is another one that most people will will probably know or have at least heard of. Mm. Um, you know, if what I like to do in these situations though is is look at what clubs the teams uh, the players are playing for in these national teams to give me an idea sometimes of the level of quality of the players if I'm not totally um, familiar with them. And I have to say, when I was reviewing this squad. Apart from the the odd one there, like like Kier and and Christensen, um, the level at which these defenders are playing at is is a bit lower than some of the other, even less, um, uh, less high profile nations. Is that unfair to say, or do you think is there a possibility defence could be a weakness for this Denmark team? I I don't think it's a weakness, but you are you are right in saying that they're not quite. You know, we talked about yesterday about how the the France team read like a <laughs> like a FIFA dream team. Um, yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, you still get AC Milan, Barcelona, Benfica in there. Um, mm-hmm. And I noticed, you know, there's a couple of players in Turkey. The Turkish league is a particularly difficult league for defenders because it's a very physically imposing league and uh, one that uh, well, we know about the volatility of the fans from some of the videos we've seen but uh it's uh you know it might not be the highest level but i think for a defender it's a very challenging level so mm-hmm. i would not be too concerned about that 
It'll certainly be worth worth keeping an eye on, um, but um, I, I do I do agree with you that it's probably not much of a concern. Um, going into the midfield is really where a lot of the danger men for 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 Denmark are. You've got um, Thomas Delaney, who I, who I know you're a big fan of at Seville, Christian Eriksen at Man United, obviously Hoiberg at Tottenham, uh, Norgard at, at Brentford, Jensen, his teammate at Brentford, and Lindstrom at Frankfurt. This is really where going to be where I think Denmark make or break the, their their World Cup. Is that too much pressure? Do you think that I'm putting on the midfield, or, or do you agree that this is where the this is where the diamonds are going to be formed for for, for Denmark? Yeah, I mean that's that's it, it's the engine room of the team. Um, Denmark's style of play involves a little bit like Celtic in the sense that it's all built around moving the ball from front to back as quickly as they can. And the the midfield is where that that really shines out. You know, Delaney sits that wee bit deeper and plays those good penetrating passes. And then you've got Eriksson, who likes to get forward and get a goal now and again. Um, Hoiberg likes a shot from distance, so he could be one to watch for uh, maybe a a couple of uh, outside-the-box barnstormers. Um, Yeah, I I think just generally, also if you look at the, the team profile, with the exception of Brentford, probably. Uh, mm-hmm. It's that wee bit levelled up based on what we saw from the, the defensive side of the team. So Yeah, even Lind- Lindstrom of Eintracht Frankfurt will be, have been playing in the Champions League this season after Frankfurt um, um, captured in that Europa League last season. So um, uh, Remind so me, he- who did they beat in the final? I can't remember. some and uh, wh- wh- Whoever it was, it was like a relatively newly formed club um, who, yeah. who to be fair did quite well in their infancy to get where they got to but um well listen if it comes back to me i'll let you know um, aye, aye. um but looking at the front line um i don't know the front line the front line in some ways is, is well that well for a start this article has put lindstrom from frankfurt in both the front line and the midfield so they need to make up their mind but the ones that stick out for me there are casper dolberg obviously of sevilla um and mikhail damsgaard who i remember being very very impressed with it at euro 2021 um right. what about yourself where's the where's the danger men in the front line for denmark for you yeah D- Damsgaard's a player, no question about that. He's he's a good one. Um, but I I really like the look of uh, of uh, Braithwaite. He's he's looked good from what I've seen of him. Um, again, returning from last year's tournament, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, well, Dolberg is consistently he's he's been consistently performing at this level for a while now. Um, they have a range of options actually because I'm looking at that and I'm not sure. Who's their starting attack? Because yeah, yeah. you know you've got of those of those eight players. I think you've got at least five of them that would make a strong case for being the main man. So it's pulls in there for for RB Leipzig. Um, I, I, I remember being impressed with him. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm impressed with the entire Leipzig team to be honest. But I do remember him standing out in the games that I've seen him play in the in the Champions League, um, both against Celtic and just generally in that group. So he's definitely got a strong case as well. Yeah, I'm glad to see him because, uh, forgive my ignorance, I wasn't actually aware he was Danish. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to see that he's going to be there and he's going to be at this tournament. That, that's excellent. Yeah, that is absolutely excellent. It's 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 a, an interesting squad and one that I certainly will be looking forward to seeing. Um, what's your thoughts, just final thoughts on... on on Denmark and their chances, let's assume they get through the group as we have suggested that they, they will do. Mm. Is are they a, is it just a case of then take their chances for the knockout rounds and see how well they do? Or is there a, a chance of them really going deep into the tournament for you? Well, here's the thing. If the form guide breaks the way that it should, i.e. the big teams all win their groups and Denmark are one of those second place teams, Denmark get Argentina in round two. Right. And here's me with it. That's the two teams that I've bet to win the tournament. Argentina <laughs> is the one that I think are probably going to win it. Denmark is my dark horse. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but if they play each other in round two, that's going to be a very, very interesting game. 
Um, but I'll, I'll make you I'll make you feel a bit better about this. Your assessment of France um, in the video that we recorded um, before um, was that they might fall victim to the to the winner's curse, the defending champions' curse, and and not mm -hmm. perform quite as well. I don't see them crashing out, but perhaps uh, Denmark pip them to the first place in the in the group stage, and and you don't have that situation where you're potentially knocking out your one of your your bets for the tournament. Yeah, I mean, I would hope so because I think France Argentina would be a cracker of a game as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see. I think I think Denmark are possibly semi final material. I'll I'll say that. Yeah, I think if they can negotiate that that second round tie is going to be the tricky one. Get beyond that, I reckon they could go around uh, the last four. I'll tell you something before we go any further. Um, I was watching a particular video today uh, where somebody was doing a World Cup predictor. Um, I, I presume you can get these on the internet where you place your teams in the group and then it draws the, the next rounds mm. for you and you pick your winners. I'm afraid to say if England get top of their group, they could have a relatively simple run to the to the later stages of the tournament, but I don't really want to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I might have seen the same video because he had um, he did make the rather out uh, the rather ambitious call that England were going to knock out France. So uh, well, there is that, there is that yeah. as well, which they which I don't think that they will do. But you know, we 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 will see. Um, Denmark are our second team in Group D. Um, we will see how they go. Liam, all the best with your bet for that one. Um, be it you, them or Argentina that get further. We shall certainly see how it goes, but make sure to join us again on Celtic Down Under for our next World Cup review and make sure and watch all the ones that we've all done for you, which are now live on the channel. Liam, thank you very much and I'll see you again soon. See you then.